let's go ahead and take a look at how this works. It's kind of interesting <coughs> because how do you build a push solution that works across different browsers and different platforms? Most push systems that you hear of are like browser specific or platform specific like Apple's push notification or the Google Cloud messaging. So how do you build a generic solution that runs across everything? So I'm actually going to, hmm. oh wait, I have a single screen this time. I can do it. This one failed last time I tried to run it, but now I'm on a single screen. I can show you. So the notification generator is a tool that lets you select various options for a notification. And let me just just come down to the bottom and say display it. And notice a notification pops up. So if you look in your slide deck, it's a pointer to tests.peter.sh notification generator. You can actually play with the notification options and see what they look like. So this is the first part. Now, we're not yet at push messaging. This is the end of the push cycle when you deliver the notification to the user. <coughs> Another way to learn about notifications is called DevQuests. So DevQuests, dev-quests.appspot.com actually walks you through the notification API, teaching it to you one little game at a time. Right, so there I just started. So I can hit begin, and now it gives me the next quest. That's another way to learn notifications. So what are push notifications? They combine the notification API, which you just saw a tiny bit of notifications, with the push API. The way push notifications work is, let's say you've got a back-end server here. <coughs> you send a message to an intermediate push service. Now, it turns out the way it works is that there is a push service here that is the generic push service for the web, and then it talks to individual gateways by the manufacturer, so it knows how to do routing. That goes ahead and sends the message across to the target operating system, to the target device. The OS wakes up the service worker and delivers the message. The service worker puts up the notification, and then when the user interacts with the notification, the service worker gets that interaction and may, in fact, wake up your application. A push message will wake up the service worker, and it can bring the app up to the front if the service worker triggers a URL. So the notification API starts with requesting a permission. So you call request permission, <coughs> and it takes a function callback that it calls you back with the status. The status is usually granted or denied. Those are short strings. You must ask for permission before you put up a notification. Notifications won't be enabled until you make this request and get the permission from the user. Then to display the notification, so if the, if the permission is granted, that'll stick to the notification class. Then go to your service worker, get the registration, and then on the registration, call show notification. So this logic typically happens, um, it actually typically happens inside of the service worker. The service worker will often just call self.getRegistration. Or you can call it from the outside, but you have to have access to the service worker. Notification options that you can play around with in those demos, things like the text, the image, vibration patterns, so long, short, long, so you can actually control the, the vibration. Long on, short off, long on. And then you can put a key on your notifications. And the reason you do this is, let's say that you're going to send a whole series of notifications from one service. Maybe you have a service that you know, is a, a home security service. So you send the notification that, uh-oh, someone just opened the front door when they weren't supposed to. You know, now somebody has gone into your, you know, has gone into your super secret money room, and now somebody's opened the vault, and now somebody's taken the money out. You don't need four of those notifications. You only need the latest one. Like, 
things are continuously getting worse. You just need the latest notification. So if you put a primary key on the notification, you could actually differentiate uh, between different notica notifications in a series and only show the most current one. Also, because there's more than one notification on the screen at a time, how do you know which one the user clicked? You can also add notification actions, those clickable buttons at the bottom. So you define an action, a keyword that you're going to use to differentiate these, and what's the title that shows up on the screen? What's, what's the button that they're going to click? So it's just a set of options, and it's just a set of actions in the option. So in this case, this is what it looks like, right? The two actions that we set were explore and dismiss with the with the titles, go to the site, or no thank you. <coughs> now, for the actual interaction, this is all driven by the service worker. So the service worker will get two events. It'll get either a notification close, which means the person basically swiped it away, or did a clear all, <coughs> or it'll get a notification click, and that click tells you what they, what they tapped on. Handler for close, pretty obvious. Get the notification. Get the primary key so you know which notification it is. Uh, and in this case, we'll log it. For the click, you'll get the event, the notification's action, and then decide what to do with it. If action is closed, then you need to explicitly close the notification. Otherwise, do an activity. So in this case, client's open window might be a URL into your own app, and that would wake up your application. Because right now, it's just inside the service worker. Service worker's up, but your app might be completely out of memory, might be completely swapped out and invisible. So you need to do an open window to wake it up. <coughs> so now push notifications. This has been notifications on the client side. How do we do push? So it starts with a subscription. The client, the, on the device, you make a call that initiates a subscription. The client approves it, the user. Um, the client on, your, on the front end sends, starts a subscription. You get back some special data that you then need to save at the server side, because the server is where the push messages are coming from. But the client is the thing that collects the data that explains how to get a message to it. So you take that token that you get, that data that you get on the client side, save it on the server side, on the back end, and then the push service, your server sends the message from the push service to the push endpoint, and the user's app handles it in the service worker. So the push API, first we'll subscribe from the page. So you check first if you have a subscription. We'll show you the code for this in a minute. You'll ask the user to subscribe. They'll say yes. You'll send the data to the server. The server hangs on to it. So to create the subscription, the service worker registration has a push manager object in it. You ask that for the subscription. And then, because that returns a promise, um, <coughs> if there's no subscription already, then you ask the user. Otherwise, you have the subscription. Just send that, but send that data down to your back end, because some of the details may have changed every time you ask. To get the right to actually subscribe, so get the registration, call subscribe. User visible only means this has to be visible to the user. It also, here's the other thing about this. So user visible only means that every push message will generate something the user can see. If that's not true, you could send push messages with empty payloads or data only payloads, and they would get routed to your code, but never notified to the user. That's actually not considered a best practice. If you're going to do that, use background sync instead. So we get a subscription, and then we store it to the server, maybe as JSON, maybe as something else. Now, what does that subscription object look like? It has a URL that you're going to call to trigger the push message, and it has um, keys for authenticating this particular subscription. 
so the, the server knows who it is and, and whether it's valid. Now, what's interesting is push messages by default um, are not particularly secure. Now, there is something we'll look at a little bit for automatic end-to-end -end encryption, but we're not there quite yet. So sending from the server, create the message, send it to that URL, that endpoint. The endpoint picks it up, figures out which browser it is, and relays it out, and then the browser receives it. So from the server, now this is an example of the web push library in Node. It was written by Matt Gaunt, who's one of the developer advocates. Easiest way ever to send push messages across the web. Um, define your payload, define your time to live. Call send notification, off you go. Very simple. Now I talked about end-to-end -end encryption. End-to-end -end encryption uses VAPID, Voluntary Application Server Identification for Web Push. Um, it's optional. The idea is that you get, and you'll have to look up the actual thing. We're not going to go into all the, the exact protocol details here. But basically, what you do with VAPID is, is before you send the push message, you ask for a VAPID token, which is time limited. Um, and it includes inside of it where this is going, the audience attributes where it's going, I identifies the subscriber, so the endpoint, and it identifies the sender. So they can mutually authenticate to each other, and it has an expiration time on it. So you get end-to-end -end encryption and mutual authentication of the device and the sender. So an example of subscribing with Vapid is, let's say your app server is published, has a public key. <coughs> so you do a conversion, and then during the subscription, you'd include the application server key. This is on the client side. So the client gets the public key for the, the other server and includes it in the reg. On the server side, the server sets up the subject, its public key and its private key before sending the message, and this is used to encrypt things correctly and to do, again, the mutual authentication. So it's really pretty straightforward. So the push shows up, wakes up the service worker. The service worker handles the message and throws up the notification. So in the service worker, listen for a push event, get the text, show notification. So the lab that goes with this is you're actually going to use the notification API to show notifications. And we actually give you a setup for doing the push API and the push events from node.js.